privilege to have with us Dale Rosengarten and uh, just a wonderful presentation I know we're in store for, store for today. Um, Dale is the founding director of the Jewish Heritage Collection at the College of Charleston, <coughs> associate director of the College's Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, and author, which shows the breadth of her expertise. Uh, excellent book, oh, I have it right here, on um, seagrass baskets. That's not the presentation today. That might be a presentation another time. Uh, seagrass baskets uh, of South Carolina low country. But the expertise in particular we're pleased with and being able to present today is a wonderful book that's represented in her authorship, uh, editorship, A Portion of the People, 300 Years of Southern Jewish Life. A beautiful book, well written, uh, edited by uh, she and her husband. Uh, graduate, undergraduate degree from Radcliffe, graduate degrees from Harvard, master, master's and doctorate, and a resident of our neighboring town of McClellanville. Join me, is that okay? That's good. <laughs> Join me in welcoming Tuesdays with Dale. Uh, this is a great outfit. Uh, it's amazing. You know, this facility is so close to my own um, I also want to point out at the back of the room there may still be some copies of my first short stack of the fall newsletter on the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, uh, from which this talk is derived. Um, it, it was um, a meeting we had here in October, uh, the first day of Hopcaw, the second day of Halloween. And uh, really had a terrific time. Uh, the folks who are responsible for that, it's a couple of them here too, the Rockington Mount Hero, has brought both docents and um, Richard Dimsky. Um, so let me talk just a minute about the title. The original title of this talk, which I wrote for the October uh, meeting, was Georgetown Jews from First Families to Front Street, which got in all the key words if you did a Google search. Right? Um, there was one moment when some, one of the publicists for the, for the program <coughs> queried, did I mean First Families of Front Street? And I thought, well, that would be a good title. It's not exactly where I was going with this, but Something needs to do that first families of Front Street idea. Um, and uh, L.C. Sloan was still with us. Um, he would be our man. Um, then, Bob and I had been corresponding for several months, and I sent him the title. And when the PR came back, it had flipped the title and subtitle. And it was from first families to Front Street. And the subtitle had been changed to the history of the Jewish community in Georgetown, maybe of Georgetown. I don't know. So I thought about that, because that's more words than I would usually put in a subtitle, and also it uses the word community, which in my scholarly world is what we call a contested word. What is the community? Is it, is it really one community, or is it several communities? Or It's just a, a word that has to be explained. But I also know and um, members of the tribe in the room will probably understand this and maybe will weigh in. The word Jews, as opposed to Jewish, is sometimes considered less polite. And South Carolinians are exceedingly polite. That's what <laughs> I've learned in the 40 plus years I've lived here. Um, they, they would prefer not to say anything that would offend, especially their good Jewish neighbors. And so using Jewish instead of Jews is a kind of actually kind of a, a gracious uh, tip. Um, and I knew I found this out when we traveled with uh, a photographer named Bill Aaron, I'll refer to later, for a portion of the people. It was a, 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 a very well orchestrated photographic tour of the Jewish communities of South Carolina from the upstate down to Georgetown. Um, and we, we had one of our crew created a crew cap, and it said Palmetto Jews. What <laughs> <laughs> did we raise eyebrows? <laughs> All over the state. Like, oh, <laughs> anyway, so I 
I think, you know, I, I really appreciated actually the addition of Jewish communities, but there was one word that I changed. <laughs> Again, so this is actually the third iteration of this title. It said, The History of the Jewish Community in Georgetown. And I will never claim to be the history. <laughs> it's too dangerous, and it's never true. And as you'll see as we go through the slides, there are just so many places that where I just leave it, you know. I've listed names, and we can spin out stories about every one of those family names. You, you could write an entirely different script with the same title. And in fact, as I said to Bob, this script would be twice as long as what I'm going to present today. Uh, when I originally wrote it, and I just you know cut it back for time, so it's a history, and um, it's definitely open to amendment, correction, criticism. Um, that's sort of why we do public presentations so we get feedback and learn new things. So all of the, all of that is to say that uh, it's just wonderful to be here and to be with a an audience very few of whom I know, which is great. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, we'll be spreading some of this, uh, this education uh, through uh, the website and YouTube, their, their videotape and this presentation. So just to begin, Georgetown was the second place in South Carolina after Charleston where Jews settled and claims the state's second oldest Jewish cemetery. It was the first place I visited after I began work on the Jewish Heritage Project in January 1995. What I knew then about Georgetown, I knew from reading. But much of what I now know comes from the memories and stories of living people. Of Georgetown's two museums, one is dedicated to Rice, and the other to the Kaminsky family, whose Jewish ancestor, Hyman Kaminsky, arrived in Georgetown in 1865. In a way, this says it all. The economy of South Carolina was based on rice, and Jews settled in the town in the mid-1700s, quickly rising to positions of prominence and power. The town had three Jewish mayors before 1818, and has had four more since. Let me start with one of Georgetown's first families. Not first chronologically, but first in the sense of importance and lasting impact. Hyman Kaminsky was born in Posen, in the German Kingdom of Prussia. He immigrated to South Carolina at age 15, went to high school in Charleston, clerked in a store in Conway Borough, and fought for the Confederacy in the 10th South Carolina Regiment. At the end of the war, when he arrived in the port town of Georgetown, Legend has it he had two silver dollars in his pocket. Within 10 years, he was, to quote Charles Joyner's eloquent essay, A Community of Memory, quote, not merely the most important man in Georgetown Jewelry in the late 19th century, but perhaps the most important man in all of Georgetown. Kaminsky had an interest in a dry goods store, hardware store, medical dispensary, boat and ore company, steamship line, the Bank of Georgetown, the Georgetown Rice Milling Company, and many other businesses. His credit report, prepared by the R.G. Dunn Company in 1875, tersely describes him as rich. <laughs> Iman married twice, first to Charlotte Virginia Emanuel, through whom he was connected to the famous Gomez family of New York. Her brother, Saul Emanuel, was a leader in the Georgetown Rifle Guards and was elected intendant, that is mayor, in 1876 and 1877. What you see on the screen here is a truly a treasured artifact of American Jewish history, which nobody in New York could believe resided in Georgetown, South Carolina. But when I found out, in fact, that the Kaminsky family owned this amazing document, um, we, we talked, we worked over many years, and just this year they had donated the Bible, the Isaac Gomez Bible, to the College of Charleston's Jewish Heritage Collection. 
it's not just the Bible. I mean, to be perfectly frank, we don't collect Bibles. Because if we did, <laughs> that's all we would collect. Every family has one. Uh, but this is a Bible in which there are literally dozens, scores of pages of inscription and narrative uh, written by members of the family. Um, and just the one that's on the screen, I don't know how clear it is, I don't know how well you can see it. But it's a graphic description of, quote, the most horrendous hurricane that hit South Carolina coast on September 27, 1822. This page reports news that Isaac received from his daughter in October, a few weeks after the terrible storm, weeks he had spent anxiously waiting to hear if she and her family were safe. <clears throat> Hyman's wife, Charlotte, died of tuberculosis in 1880, and five years later he married Rose Baum, <clears throat> related to the Baums of Camden and Conway, a daughter of Manis Baum, whose brother, Marcus, was killed by friendly fire at the Battle of the Wilderness, and for whom Bernard Manis Arup is named. Rose raised her only child, Harold, with his four half-siblings, Edwin, Nathan, Joseph, and Lina. <clears throat> You'll notice that Lina is missing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Nathan married Julia, another daughter of Manis Baum, confused yet. <laughs> um, and this intricacy of family networks is typical of South Carolina Jews and other white people. All the white people in this state are married what they call endogamously, in other words, within the kin group. African Americans scrupulously avoided endogamous marriage. They, they would not marry cousins, they married out of the kin group. It's a cultural difference that actually makes a very big difference. Um, and Jews, in this way, and as you will see in many other ways, follow the mores and the customs of the white community. Um, Hyman and Rose's son, Harold, however, married out of the clan. He wed Julia Pyatt from an old Episcopalian plantation family, and the couple moved into the house that is now the Kaminsky Museum. In, 18, in 1930, Harold was elected mayor, the sixth of Georgetown's seven Jewish mayors. On the fateful day of December 7, 1941, he was stationed at Pearl Harbor in the Pacific, and he survived to tell the tale. So let me just do a, a little <coughs> postscript or sidebar here, some information that I, I recently learned from Marsha and Kim Kaminsky. Um, you know, why was Lina not in that picture? Um, Lina was, had Down syndrome. And Marcia has shown me a picture of her, maybe the only one that exists, of her shown from the side. Um, which, you know, as a, 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 a sort of aesthetic choice. But in the pantheon of these fabulous studio portraits, of which the Kaminskys have a lot and also have given us at the library, so they're now part of our collection. Um, this daughter was sort of left out. Um, I will say that uh, Hyman Kaminsky named the ship that I showed earlier. If you look closely, you see the flag, the line of Kaminsky. That was actually named for his mother, so I'm presuming that the daughter was named for, for his mother, which is, of course, uh, an um, act of great respect. <coughs> Uh, Georgetown's first Jewish Jews had arrived a full century before Hyman. Abraham and Solomon Cohen moved here from Charleston in the early 1760s. Sons of Rabbi Moses Cohen, first chazin or prayer leader of Charleston's Kahal Kadosh Beth Elohim, they had emigrated from London with their father in 1750. They quickly became successful merchants and active participants in public affairs and social organizations. That's Abraham and Solomon Cohen. Abraham Cohen was a mason, a founder of the Georgetown Library Society and the Georgetown Fire Company, a commissioner of streets and markets. His brother Solomon was a member of the Library Society, a sergeant in the Winyall Light Dragoon, <coughs> Dragoons, a tax collector and intendant or mayor of Georgetown. 
Both men served as postmasters and both belonged to the Winyaw Indigo Society, a fraternal group with intellectual interests responsible for opening a school for children. And just note, as a side note, you see how many of the important institutions that exist today in Georgetown, especially the intellectual institutions, the library society, the Winyaw Indigo Society. This was a very elite town, very, very affluent all based on rice. Abraham owned a plantation, which was unusual for Jewish people, a blacksmith shop in town, and 21 slaves. He worked as an auctioneer, selling enslaved Africans and other property offloaded from ships in the port of Georgetown. During the American Revolution, he served in the militia, and in 1791, he welcomed George Washington, first president of the United States and fellow Mason, to Georgetown. Now, let me jump back to this family tree. And again, I don't know if you can make out all the words, but I flagged some of the people I want to talk about here. And this, uh, by the way, is one of hundreds of Jewish first families published by Malcolm, Rabbi Malcolm Stern and online, on site of the American Jewish Archives. So if you put in AJA genealogies, something like that, you, you can find almost anybody that is Stern considered a quote first family. So here you, here you see two brothers who fought for the Patriots in the American Revolution and one for the Tories. That's interesting to begin with. And, and of course the communities did split um, during the Revolutionary War. You may note Solomon's son, a rice planter named Solomon Cone Jr., who in 1836 married Miriam Moses, a niece reared by the prominent Jewish educator Rebecca Bratz from Philadelphia. Now, anybody who knows anything pretty much about American Jewish history, Rebecca Bratz is this huge, towering figure. And this was actually, her niece was right here. In, in, outside of Georgetown on a plantation, writing letters <coughs> about the beautiful oak trees and the hanging moss, etc. Et Solomon and Bella's children are the only Cohen progeny named in Malcolm Stern's genealogy. But we now know, thanks to decades of research by genealogist Sadie Day Pasha, that Abraham Cohen also left heirs. He lived on Prince Street with Margaret McWhorter, a free person of color known as Free Peggy. And when he died in 1800, he bequeathed Lot 54 to her in his last will and testament for her, quote, sole benefit, use, and behoof during her life. He also left her the, quote, eight Negroes in his household, including his probable children, Caesar, Rose, Harry, and Bynum and Bina's four children, Lucy, Judy, Billy, and Tom. There is a possibility, reported in the Chicago Tri Tri Tribune, the New York Times, and elsewhere, that among the descendants of Free Peggy McWhorter was Rose Ella Cohen, who was the wife of Fraser Robinson and Michelle Obama's great-grandmother. <laughs> In the absence of solid documentation, Rose Ella Cohen's ancestry remains a titillating speculation. What we can say for sure, and this is the more important point, Georgetown Jews participated in every aspect of the slave system, selling enslaved people, owning slaves, and yes, living with people of color and producing mixed race offspring, possibly including Michelle. <laughs> Georgetown's Jewish population grew significantly in the decades after the American Revolution as rice production and profits soared. By 1800, the town's 80 Jews made up roughly 10% of the white population. The names that appear in Charleston's Beth Halloween records suggest they maintain ties to the Charleston community. Antebellum Jewish Georgetonians included the Joseph, Solomon, Solomons, Moses, Aronson, Hart, Wolf, Sesportis, Emsden, Henry, Lopez, Samson, and Emmanuel families. They were merchants, businessmen, lawyers, auctioneers, port agents, bank directors, pharmacists, physicians, and an occasional planter. 
and this is what I mean by this is just a history. Because you could, you could write a history of any one of those families, or all of them. And in fact, I couldn't flash slides as we went along, because we have some documentation uh, of a lot of these families. Um, it, all it takes is uh, time and interest. And I really encourage people, whether you're in the family or not, to, to do some of the digging uh, for us, <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the historians who you know, don't have time to, to figure out everything. Jewish men were deeply involved in town life through government ser service, holding position, positions such as warden, clerk of court, tax collector, coroner, commissioner, postmaster, customs inspector, state legislator, and intended. Whatever their view on politics, and they were prominent, they were prominent on both sides of the nullification crisis in the 1830s, that's sometimes called a rehearsal for secession, the, the first major face-off between the feds and the states' rights people down here. Um, whatever their views on politics, Georgetown Jews rallied behind the Confederacy once the war broke out. Five who died in, in fighting for the South were buried in the Jewish cemetery. Some Jewish Georgetonians rose to high ranks in the CSA, that's the Confederate States of America for any Yankees in our midst. Abraham Cohen Myers, a, a scion of both the Cohen family and Mordecai Myers, who arrived in Georgetown about the same time as the Cohen. <coughs> Abraham graduated from West Point in 1833 and fought in the Seminole Wars and the Mexican War. Fort Myers, Florida was named for him. Appointed Quartermaster General of the Confederacy in March 1861, he held the post until Confederate President Jefferson Davis dismissed him in August 1863, a humiliation that embittered him for the rest of his life. The number of Jews living in Georgetown immediately after the Civil War dropped to 54, a downward trend typical of other South Carolina towns in the post-war era. Those who remained continued to be active in the town's economic, political, and social life during and after Reconstruction. <clears throat> dur dur excuse me, during and after Reconstruction, the Samson and Emanuel mercantile businesses thrived. Saul Emanuel <coughs> gave up his father's business to become a partner with his brother-in-law, Hyman Kaminsky. So this is something I've just discovered, and, and this is one of the joys of being a research historian, things land on your lap and then suddenly a light goes on. So I've mentioned Sala Emanuel before. He was elected mayor of Georgetown in 1876 and 1877. Did anybody associate anything with the date 1876? Wade Hampton was elected. There you go. Wade Hampton, the great redeemer, basically threw out the radical Republicans, quote, black rule, and reinstated white rule, redeemed the state from the occupiers and their African American allies. Um, it was a sea change on the state level, and actually, in those years of the mid to late 1870s, it, it moved across the South. Reconstruction was over, Jim Crow began. It was a really terrible time for people of color. Mm -hmm. um, it just turns out that Wade Hampton, the Redeemer, appointed one of his trusty henchmen as adjutant general, whose name was Edwin Warren Moise, E.W. Moise, from a very important Charleston Sumter Jewish family, E.W. Moise. So 77, Emmanuel is the mayor here. And who does the Winyaw Indigo Society invite to give its talk in 78? E.W. Moise. So I, what, what came literally flopped on my desk, thanks to my, my beloved colleague, Harlan Green, was this program, the address that Moise gave here in Charleston, here in um, Georgetown for the um, Winyaw Indigo Society. And the contents of it, frankly, are unremarkable. It's very political. He says, thank God we're back in, on track. You know, we're, we've got the, the right people in, in the saddle. And by the way, um, what, what kind of education should we provide for our women 
Um, they need to be able to speak well and so, but please, no silence, oh man. <laughs> Very interesting text. So, Kaminsky, who is the brother-in-law now, his wife is this, the sister of Saul Emanuel, Kaminsky and his cohort were joined at the beginning of the 20th century by Bernard Manus Baruch, perhaps South Carolina's most famous Jewish son, at least until Ben Bernanke. <laughs> Baruch became known as the park bench statesman and advisor to presidents. A graduate of New York City's City College, he made a fortune on Wall Street by the age of 30, and in 1905 began buying properties north of Georgetown eventually acquiring some 16,000 acres, an area equal in size to Manhattan Island. <laughs> Baruch, whose father had been a surgeon in the Confederate Army, arrived on Waccamaw Neck as part of the second Yankee invasion. <laughs> uh, and I, I would guess that some of the people in this room are part of the third. <laughs> <laughs> um, each winter between Thanksgiving and Easter, Baruch and his wife, Annie Griffin Baruch, and their three children, Belle, Bernard, and Renee, Rennie, actually, uh, traveled with a European trained staff, governesses, and tutors from New York to Hobcock. The picture on the left, which many of you may not be familiar with, is was the original house on the barony at Hobcock. And I say original, it's late 19th century. It's not original, original, but it was the house that was there when, when the Bruce bought the property. They called it the relic, and it burned to the ground in 1930. And what was what uh, Baruch erected instead, which is now known as Hobcock House, was essentially a fireproof house, <coughs> quite legitimately. Uh, he built it so it could not burn. Um, invited guests and extended family marveled at the beauty and the climate uh, of the low country in those precious cooler months. Let me just pause for a second and point out Simon uh, to your right, Simon Brew, who's again, huge character in South Carolina history. Um, he actually does not have a full length biography, which is something. Does he leave? Just one. Just one. Who, who's, um, I'll say her name later. So okay. Like, yeah, Patricia's okay. her first name. Oh, yeah, Span. Yeah, Span. Yeah, yeah, Span. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he's, he's someone who, who deserves more attention, a apart from being an immigrant who made good. Um, he, he came, at, they say, on the same boat as Hyman Kaminsky. I've heard that. Uh, so that's something like 1854. Um, he, he got a medical degree literally as the war broke. He, he, he was in Richmond finishing his medical degree. And they put him in the field immediately. He said he started amputations before he had even lanced a boy. <laughs> but what he realized, and it's an enormous breakthrough and use for the Confederacy, um, was that um, they needed to improve their hygiene and sterilize their surgical equipment between operations. And he started instituting those procedures and saved lives. How many, who knows how many lives? And then after the war, he continued this line of sort of public health hygiene, set up um, public baths for the, the poor immigrants who were pouring into the Lower East Side by then he lived in New York. Um, and he's known as the father of hydrology or you know, sort of water treatments. Uh, a very important man medically, and an interesting man uh, in terms of his political allegiance. Um, and that's uh, the, the four sons and his bro and the brother in the picture, his wife, who is quite a personage herself. Yeah. The guests at Hopkoff feasted on the abundance and variety of wildlife at Hopkoff, which produced 100 duck days. I want to get to 100 duck days. Um, the wildlife obviously was what brought these northerners down to this area. And it was true up and down the coast. Wealthy families were buying former rice plantations whose owners were too impoverished to keep them up. And they were preserving them, even to this day, basically as duck hunting clubs. Um, of course, Baruch, 
had other purposes as well. And again, this is a whole book or two books worth of, of uh, information I'm skipping over. But he was very close to the powers of the, really the global world, not just in, in Washington, but uh, as you see Winston Churchill and, and Churchill's daughter visited Hancock on the left. He did have FDR as a guest at Hopkins <coughs> for a month in May of 1944, as they were planning D-Day. So there are a lot of connections that are extremely important in the global world. A few slides back, you may have noticed he was at Versailles with Wilson, which was actually the pinnacle of his political influence and power. Um, Again, we could talk a lot about this because Wilson himself spent those reconstruction years in Columbia, South Carolina, in a house that is now interpreted by historic Columbia. Um, it's called the, the uh, Pre uh, Hampton Preston House. And they're, they're really redoing it because there's a lot of new information about Wilson and his politics. And one might speculate that he got those political views and Simon Booth got his political views in those same 10 years after the Civil War, living in the heart of South Carolina. Um, moving, moving on with our story here, though, Georgetown's money Jews spurred the growth of the town in the latter decades of the 19th century. They extended rail lines, opened communications, and supported economic enterprise. But they invested no energy or money in developing Jewish communal life. <coughs> that development awaited their immigrant successors, the Jews of Eastern Europe, who created Georgetown's 20th century Jewish institutions. From the late 19th, well into the 20th century, Jewish stores along Front Street were pillars of economic life. Merchants named Moses, Flom, Breslauer, Brillis, Fogel, Gladstone, Izier, Eisman, Rosen, Schneider, Ringel, Schenk, Weinberg, and Dundas sold groceries, clothing, carpets, window shades, cotton, rice, naval stores, hay, oats, corn, drugs, jewelry, furniture, and appliances. They were the merchants of Front Street. It's kind of stunning if you actually go business by business. And by the way, the great ledgers of the Kaminsky hardware, which are now on display in the Rice Museum, really spell out this mercantile community. You could, you could reconstruct the whole thing, the, write a whole dissertation about this period of time and those merchants who took over Front Street and um, really made it uh, a new world because um, Rice no longer was king. Taking just a little sidestep here, I, I want to talk a little bit about Jewish geography embroidered on a quilt. Um, Sally Weinberg Lewenthal, and I've mentioned those names in my, my list there. Um, the, the Weinbergs, uh, Sally was the first who came to Georgetown, um, uh, and she built a drugstore for <coughs> the Eismans next door to her bakery. The Weinbergs, the Eismans, and the Iziers were all family connected between Darlington, Manning, and Georgetown. And Sally sat in the back of her bakery and embroidered these quilts, which, again, have been gifted to the Jewish Heritage Collection, um, and, and signed them. They're sort of autograph quilts, uh, album quilts. Signed them with the names of kin and the, pl the places they came from. So again, a close study of these textiles, you could map out, you could draw a different kind of family tree um, of this inter interlocked family. Um, Albert Snyder married Fanny Lewenthal of Darlington, South Carolina. Uh, in, um, 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 one slide behind. This is the prescription book for the Eisman drugstore on Front Street, also in our collection. Um, it's a really amazing document, especially for a chemist. It gives the, literally the <coughs> ingredients of each prescription uh, handwritten. <coughs> So Albert Schneider married Fanny Lewenthal of Darlington in 1911. They opened Hyman Snyder Company, a dry goods store on Front Street, with the help of Fanny's uncle Hyman, who provided a letter of credit. Brothers-in-law, Harry Rosen and Albert Snyder, 
their wives, Dora and Fanny, were daughters, Sally and Philip Lewenthal, started the new store in 1920. Initially selling men's and ladies' clothing and later furniture and appliances. Snyders lived in the Rainey House on Prince Street. It's Fanny and Albert at their 50th wedding anniversary. The Rainey House on Prince Street from 1906 to 1969 where their children grew up. Abe Fogel on the left son of immigrants, and Sylvan Rosen, whose father came from New York, played the all-American game of baseball together. Sylvan ultimately married Irma Levkoff, whose brother, Irving, had been his classmate at USC. And Irma is the tall girl. She is always tall on the right. There's an interesting record of camaraderie among merchants around the state. In this regard, I suspect South Carolina is just like every place else. I don't think this is unusual. But here are Sylvan and Irma, again, the tall one, attend, attending an opening of Edwards. Um, which Edwards? We do not know. Because Edward Kronzberg, who was um, the sort of prince, sort of the fogel of King Street in Charleston, was Edward Kronzberg. At, at the height of his business uh, career, they had over 30, 35, I think, uh, outlets around the state. Um, in this particular picture, and we, we will eventually nail it, but um, Charleston's rabbi of Emmanuel, the conservative synagogue, Gerald Wolpe, is in this picture. Um, and we, we think, and I ask for any confirmation from people who were here at the time, that in the 1970s, a branch of Edwards opened in Georgetown. You have to check that out, but uh, it might, might have been a somewhat short-lived, um, but I'd love to find out more about that. <laughs> the Rosens raised Dick, who was named Benedict, not for Benedict Weinberg, but for B.M. Saraski from Aiken. The Rosens raised Dick and his brother Larry to be good citizens. Sylvan was elected for six consecutive terms as mayor. Irma worked for the Red Cross and other nonprofits. During World War II, Georgetown's Jews joined the military. Here is Cecil Snyder, the one of the three brothers who did not go into his family business but went into law instead. <coughs> He's in Switzerland with his JAG Corps colleagues at the end of the war. Abe Fogel in Navy uniform. He did not he was stationed abroad. He did not meet his older son, Tad, until the boy was 18 months old. His father, Harry, did not survive the war. His children said he died of a broken heart when he heard his sister had been murdered by the Nazis. So this is something that um, probably uh, is, a, again, a common denominator of most Jewish Americans today. Most Jewish Americans descend from this East European way of immigration. And most of us had family in Eastern Europe. Most of those families were destroyed. So you scratch the surface of almost any contemporary Jewish American family, and you'll find a Holocaust history. Um, it's true in my family, and I think we could ask specifics, but I think you'd find it. You have to ask because it's not, you know, I'm third generation, it's not, you know, the top of my mind. Uh, but I, I have noticed as I've um, been a professional in the field of American Jewish history that many, many of my colleagues, their, their motivating force, the thing that is driving them, is their desperate attempt to regain a history that was wiped out very, very quickly. Um, it's definitely true for me. That's, again, another story and another slideshow. But um, I want to point out Abe Fogel with Bernard Baruch and no doubt, what is it, uh, Chucky? Um, in the lobby of the Prince George Hotel. Um, you can see, you can imagine the sort of network of wild game. <laughs> And they, there's a wonderful letter uh, that recently showed up about the Georgetown Front Street merchants 
adjourning at midnight when they closed their stores on Saturday to the Prince George where they had a marvelous dinner catered by an African-American chef, including much wild game. So it's, it's kind of a, a theme here. After uh, worshiping for nearly two centuries in borrowed quarters, notably the Winyaw Indigo Society, in 1950, George Tonians decided that dedicated a synagogue, Beth Elohim, first founded in 1904, and named for her sister congregation in Charleston. Again, this is, follows a national trend of the baby boom and post-war prosperous era. The community had started raising money right after the war. Note here a letter dated 1941 from Cecil Schneider to Bernard Baruch, respectfully asking him to contribute to the building fund. The next two decades marked the heyday of the congregation. Sunday school, sisterhood, Hanukkah parties, pour on balls, all conscientiously documented and annotated by Alwyn Goldstein, self-appointed archivist and historian who had moved to Georgetown in 1938. He told me, I was vice president in charge of anything that no one else wanted. <laughs> <laughs> How many people remember Almonds when it was open? But the generation raised so tenderly grew up and moved away, encouraged by their broken-hearted parents to follow their dreams. This is Alwyn and his children, um, Steve and Ross, both of whom have pursued wonderful careers elsewhere, and that is the story. It seemed as if Beth Elohim could not hold on. Eight stalwart elders, when we brought photographer Bill Aaron to Georgetown to document the community, that was what was left. But lo and behold, a modern day Moses arrived, <laughs> Elizabeth Moses, that is, and led a revival, the results of which are apparent today. The photograph of the eight elders and this one were made by uh, Bill Aaron, a very prominent Los Angeles-based photographer. And this was the day I went to interview Alwyn, Alwyn and, and uh, Philip in the back of Alwyn's now derelict store. You can see what I mean about archivist. <coughs> um, these two men met in the back of that store pretty much every day and went over and talked about what they did and then probably went to lunch. But when I had arrived, this was, in, this was Jan January 1995, right at the beginning of the project, they, it was as if they had been waiting for me all their lives to sit down and ask them to tell their stories. And they had stories. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I just wish that I'd been, been able to go back two and three and four and five times because there was no end to the stories. And every time I cross the Sandpit River on, over the Sylvan L. Rosen Bridge, I marvel at the history of the Jews of Georgetown. Thank you very much. Plenty of, plenty of time for questions and comments. And got some of the key players here in the audience. Um, yeah. What is the uh, population now for Georgetown and like where you live in McClellanville and Darlington? All those areas? Oh, the Jewish population? Mm -hmm. um, in McClellanville, it's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you, they're basically myself and my husband. Um, and really, there, there, there were individual Jews who lived in McClellanville in the past. Some of them are quite interesting. Um, and some, one at least, has descendants, but long ago uh, they uh, stopped being Jews, which is typical of those the early families. Um, there was also a man named Isaac Frankel who ran a dry goods store in McClellanville in the 1930s and p 
people today who remember him said that in uh, 1938, when Hitler took over Austria and Anschutz, he, he said to local people, I am a man without a country. He came from his home, to home country, was Austria. Georgetown, I don't know. Richard, do you know? I really don't. What was the question? What was the question? Uh, the question was how many, what's the population, the Jewish population today? Um, you know, if you go by the congregation, which you can't really, because number one, the congregation comes from all up and down the Grand Strand. But when the, when those eight elders were were, you know, keep, keeping the lights on, uh, they they might be lucky to get a million ten people on a Friday night. And I've been to holiday services recently at Beth Elohim where they pretty much fill the sanctuary, 40, 50, 60 people. Um, membership is, what, about 65 member families? Uh, no, 40, what is it? 42 families. 42, 42, 42 families member are. families, meaning each family might yeah. be one. Uh, but um, it was really through uh, Elizabeth Moses's hard work, she, she just made phone calls. I mean, she was like a one-person band calling people she recognized either because of their names or because they passed through Georgetown and asked if there was a synagogue, inviting them to, the con to, to the services. And she just drummed up all these people from, uh, like I said, Litchfield, you know, the Grand Strand, uh, uh, you know, Sun, Sun Belt migrants. Uh, and it worked. That's all I can say. It's quite remarkable. Uh, but it, it saved this congregation. We all thought it was a goner. And Elizabeth had worked for me. She'd been a very important person putting together a portion of the people because her family from Sumter, the Moses family of Sumter, are another first family of enormous importance. Her ancestor, Meyer Moses, goes back to the Revolution and forward, you know, War of 1812, Civil War, etc. So her family was loaded with artifacts that wound up in the exhibit. We wouldn't have gotten them without it. I think, without her very conscientious cultivation of, you know, building of trust uh, among that family. She was, by the way, a Jew by choice. Her mother was Catholic. She was raised Catholic. Um, she spent some Friday nights in the synagogue uh, with her father, so she was familiar, but she was not a Jew. And when she became mature, she decided she wanted to convert, and she converted. But she, she learned enough so she could actually lead, lead services. Um, I will say, for those of you who know Elizabeth, she has now made the very bold move of relocating to Sumter again uh, because she got a great job with the Sumter County Museum, but in her very quiet way is going to try to revive Temple Sinai in Sumter, which is in the same doldrums that uh, Beth Halloween was in. So, uh, what was the other town you asked about? Well, I noticed that Hartsville. Hartsville was mentioned too. Okay. And Darlington. And Darlington. So towns like Darlington, it's interesting. Darlington and Manning, I can say specifically. At one point, there were enough Jews that they thought they would build a synagogue, and they bought land. It's usually like this long strip, you know, uh, of land. But they never built the built the company uh, house of worship. So that shows you that the population peaked. And then it started falling off to, to the extent that they decide, they thought better <coughs> investing in the capital uh, campaign. Um, what they do in places like Darlington, and this is this is still true to this day, they they find a synagogue in a in a neighboring town close enough so they can get there. Um, and I'll tell a story that Marilyn's mother, Deborah, told me. And, I, did, I do want to mention and dedicate this whole program to Debbie Baruch Abrams and Betty Fogel, two of the grand dimes of Georgetown Jewelry who both passed away this in the past year. But um, Debbie and her sister Carolyn, they grew up in Camden, part of the Baruch family, and <clears throat> they, um, in order to go to Sunday school, they would be sent to Sumter which had a more active congregation, and they would pass through Bishopville, and their mother would say, don't get off the bus. 
Bishop Phil. <laughs> Bishop Phil had a reputation of being like the Wild West. <laughs> what would happen if you got off the bus in Bishop Phil? But um, they, uh, you know, they people. It was one of the, the important things about Jewish life in, in any uh, minority community like this is there were networks across the across the state that help people sustain what they could in Jewish life. Yeah. Can you, despite the prominence, clearly the role in making Georgetown what it is, um, can you talk some about discrimination faced by, especially back in the day? Um, you know, we, I've, I've always, I always ask that question, and um, it doesn't, it comes up a little bit in some of the stories in this issue. We did a, an earlier issue with several. Uh, stories about Georgetown specifically by Laz Schneider, uh, Lefka. Um, and by and large, people of, of that generation, which is my generation, you know, grew up in the 50s and 60s, really didn't feel it. Um, th that's not to say that it wasn't there, but there, there has been, and, and this is my opinion as a, as a historian who studied this now for over 20 years, remarkably little anti-Semitism in the state of South Carolina. Don't, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. And you'll notice, um, you know, that, that there's never been a Jewish governor. Although there would have been a Max Stellar. <laughs> I mean, you know, there have been plenty of Jewish mayors, some Jewish legislators, but um, it's, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. The, the good news is that the Jews have prospered and they, they were permitted, literally, uh, since 1669 when the Fundamental Constitutions was written, to practice their religion openly and, and have no, no, no uh, official discrimination. The bad news is that the reason that was so is because they were re recognized as white people. And South Carolina was desperate to get more white people as a bulwark against this terrifying black majority that they were building to, to, to run their rice plantations. I mean, this is true in all of South Carolina history. If you look for what, you know, why some people are welcomed, it's usually because some other people are discriminated against. So Jews were the, had the good fortune of white privilege. And that was true then, and I would, to a certain extent, I would say it's true now. There was a bad period, and I don't know, maybe people from Georgetown could talk about this. The 1930s was a terrible period in, in American history of xenophobia, you know, the Red Scares, huge surge in lynching, um, 1915, Leo um, Frank, the, the, the Jewish uh, entrepreneur, was, was lynched in, in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, and that just sent you know, shock waves through the whole southern Jewish community. There were some very bad decades, and they corresponded, they coincided with Jim Crow. It's a bad time. You know, Hitler was taken over in Germany. There were, there were Nazis on the radio here in, in uh, South Carolina and, the, and other places in the United States. It was a bad time. Um, I think the impact of the Holocaust, and again, this is personal, um, the, the very elite Jewish families who've been here for generations and who felt they were aristocrats and they were impervious to any injury suddenly realized that when it, when it came, you know, push came to shove, they were Jewish, they were Jews, and they would be targeted like anybody else if, if the white supremacists, if the, the neo-Nazis uh, came to power. Um, and in general, I think people began to realize the cost of racism. I mean, the, the National Socialists gave it a new meaning, uh, wiping out, attempting to wipe out an entire race of people, what they called a race. Um, but I, even, you know, even in the Deep South, I think it started to dawn on people that this was a very dangerous um, way to go. But, you know, we're, we're seeing a resurgence, so you never know. I remember just this is Cecil's daughter. <laughs> when, when I was very young, I mean, this would be <coughs> 50s, late 50s, I remember my father telling me 
uh, that we weren't going somewhere we had planned to go because there was a KKK uh, march. I don't know if it was, I remember it as being Front Street, but I don't, I don't know where it was. It was somewhere around Georgetown. And I remember my parents telling me that, that those people were bad and that they were going, they hated the Jews and they wanted us to go away. Other than that, though, and, and I, Marilyn might remember, I don't know, but until I went away to college, I never experienced anything resembling anti-Semitism mm -hmm. anywhere in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's also, uh, there were obviously KKK marches I mean, we have many stories in our oral history archives, and the, and there's almost kind of a trope. It, it's I I, ha I have to assume it happened because too many people tell the story. On the other hand, it couldn't have happened in every town, and it seems to the 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 the, the, the Ku Kluxers are marching down the street in their in their robes and their hoods, uh, and the Jewish merchant is standing in his doorway, and he says he starts calling them by name. <laughs> I, I sold him his shoes. I know those shoes. And the other funny story, and this is in portions of the people. Uh, uh, Jack Bass wrote a great little essay called uh, "Just Like One of Us," um, that the Jews were actually tapped to sell the client the sheets from which they made their clothes. And you may all know that. Um, when Bernard Baruch and one of his brothers was digging in his father's, in the attic of his house, in his father's chest, right under the Confederate uniform, he found the robe, a robe of the Klan. So apparently Simon Baruch uh, was a member of the Klan. Now that would have been in the very early days. And again, you know, if you know more about Klan history, and it's not my expertise, but it went through phases. The, the 18th, 70s, 80s, 90s was one kind of clan, mm -hmm. and then what happened again in the early uh, decades of the 20th century was a much more virulent and, um, uh, I don't know, more renegade, I think, you know, more vigilante outfit. But, you know, Wade Hampton, I'm not giving him a pass. I mean, these, these guys and the militia, such as the one that saw Emmanuel was involved with the, the riflemen, these were, um, uh, Self-defense units, they were militia whose purpose was to not allow the African Americans to take control and control the ballot boxes and sometimes uh, perform what, what in the Jewish history we call pogroms, sort of an officially sponsored attack on a community. Um, there were such and some of them were deadly, Tulsa, Wil Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, they wiped out the town of Rosewood, Florida. I mean, this was a bad period of American history. <coughs> but Georgetown, yeah. Um, in the, um, among the slave owners uh, who were Jewish, is there any evidence that they um, imposed their religion on their slaves? Um, I would almost say to the contrary, in the sense that <coughs> Uh, Jews are not, do not proselytize. They don't try to convert people. Um, even the current organization called Chabad, which is uh, kind of a missionary group, they're not trying to convert non-Jews. They're trying to bring people who are Jewish into more close observance. They don't, they don't go out and try to convert other people. Um, there, there was one apparently one Jewish African American in the early years in KKBE, his name was Billy Simmons, and he was a newspaper man, he's been written up. He's about the only example that, that we have of a, of a, of a black Jew in, in one of these congregations. Um, you know, I think that it, it probably varied from place to place, but I don't think there was really any effort to, to um, convert or I, I think Jewish slave owners probably encouraged, I know they encourage their, their uh, enslaved workers to be good Christians. So in a lot of records of, of plantation um, life, they'll talk about the big do on Christmas when they gave all their slaves the day off and everybody had a ball and you know they, they facilitate, the Jewish slave owners facilitated Christian holidays among their 
so-called people. Um, it's just not, it's not a Jewish thing to convert. There's also, and I'm, again, I'm not a biblical scholar, but there's also um, some uh, support in the Bible, I believe, for Jews who own slaves, and slavery, of course, goes way back, to manumit, free their slaves after seven years. And that practice did not <laughs> carry over into the New World. It just didn't. People um, <coughs> occasionally would free their slaves for various reasons, usually because of a family connection, like, I, I don't know how free Peggy got her freedom, but that's a typical situation where if Abraham Cohen owned her, he could, at that point, this is very early in this late 18th century, he could have freed her, and, and, and might have. After 1822, they closed all those doors and loopholes, and could, almost could not free a person um, legally. It's probably more than you needed to know. This, this is a, history is endlessly interesting. And there's, there's new stuff. I mean, every day, new stuff arrives, you know, in somebody's, from somebody's archive or somebody's attic, walking from the attic, uh, that just is like a new, a new idea. But, and please let me just say, find that book, enjoy a portion of the people, edited by Dr. Dale Rosengarden and her husband, Dr. Ted Rosengarden, with those essays that she's mentioned. It changed my life. I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. I had very little knowledge of South Carolina's Jewish history. And Dale serving on the Board of Trustees at the Bell Baruch Foundation has made a big impact in how we broaden the story. But that book published in 2000, is that right? 2002. 2002. Mm -hmm. You know, started first as an exhibit. And I was at the exhibit in Columbia, and I was writing on a little tiny notebook as fast as I could. And the curator came up to me and says, you know we're going to publish a book. And I said, okay. <laughs> I, I couldn't wait that long. But it, I, and it's a beautiful book in addition to. But I know the library has a copy, and they are for sale um, locally as well as online. It's, it's really a bargain. It's still $35. Beautiful. We underwrote the, the, the publication, and you can buy it online, Amazon or whatever, uh, from its USC Press. I also want to say, um, row upon row, which I see you have uh, the original. From the library. Yeah, this is the, the very, very first edition. It went through several more editions. This is very much still in print. It's still the go-to source for you know the tourist trade in Charleston. But in 2008, uh, we published uh, another bigger, better, beautiful, really beautiful, uh, comparable to a uh, portion of people. In fact, exactly the same number of pages, full color. It's called Grassroots African Origins of an American Art. Grassroots African Origins of an American Art. Also available, you know, online in paperback or hardcover. A little more expensive than a portion of people. But uh, it, it was uh, really the result of my doctoral uh, research which I did in the late 90s while I was starting to develop the, the um, uh, portion of the people project. Um, and we, what myself and my co-curator Enid Shulker did was we tried to bring African baskets in conversation with South Carolina baskets. And I'm, I suspect all of you know about the great tradition of low country coil grass baskets that is still thriving today. Um, we, you know, we thought if we could just bring these traditions across the ocean and bring them together, we'd get some ma some magic would be made, and it was. And we wound up that exhibit wound up in 2010 at the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. the National Museum of African Art, and those folks just knocked it out of the ballpark. That it was so beautiful there. They they really put a lot of energy into redesign, and it's it was a great show. And the book is great. And unfortunately, 2008, we opened that show literally the week that the stock market crashed. The financial system went under. So it didn't do a lot for the basket makers, unfortunately, uh, because then it was whatever, four years of serious recession. But. Dale, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.